Okay, everyone will begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, you want to pray, so we will pray with you. Come, divine will, come pray in our praying. Lord Jesus, we give you the little pebble of our will in exchange for the gift of living in your most holy and divine will. We fuse ourselves into your will, Lord Jesus. We fuse into your will every thought, word and breath, every heartbeat, all of our memory, intellect and will. We fuse into your will all our fears, worries, anxieties and wounds. We fuse into your will our every act and all our hopes and dreams. We abandon ourselves to your will and we make an act of resignation to your most holy and divine will. And I'll, I'll say to Hail Mary if you could pray it quietly, okay? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners now and at our death. Amen. Amen. And we'll do the Our Father once again, if you could all pray it silently, and I'll pray it out loud. Our Father, who art in heaven, and it be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lady Queen of the Divine Will, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, pray for pray us. us. St. Hannibal the Fancier, pray for us. I'd like to just ask us all just to keep a minute in silence, if you don't mind. Um, interiorly praying whatever you feel inclined to pray, just to do it for a moment. In the, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome everyone. And I think we've got a new customer next next to Nina. Hello, Nina's daughter. Is it over there? <laughs> Welcome. Um so today, uh tonight we're gonna begin a, a series on the Eucharist. And um I want us to do this within the context of the liturgy. So Tonight I'm going to give you some um, foundational principles regarding the liturgy and the Eucharist and the necessity of the Eucharist and a little bit on Louisa and what she teaches us about the multiplication of the, div of the divine life in the soul. Okay, so first thing first, liturgy, because we have the Eucharist within the context of liturgy Liturgy, the word liturgy comes from, I think it's a Greek word, litogos, which means the work work of God. Okay, so the liturgy is the work 
of God. It's very important to understand this because it's not the work of of um, of man or woman. It's the work of God. And there are several aspects of there are several different liturgies which are God's work, but it's worth noting. So obviously mass. So once the priest starts the mass with the sign of the cross, to the very end, to the very dismissal, everything that is taking place that's litur liturgical is God's work. Okay. One example of this work of God is when a person goes forward to proclaim the word of God, it could be a lay reader, for example, going up to read St. Paul's letter to the Romans. It is Christ who is proclaiming that word. The lay reader is participating in Christ's work. Okay, It's really, really important to understand this. Don't, how many of you put, ever do the Divine Office? Just put your hands up for me. Divine Office. Excellent. So, the Divine Office is liturgy. Thank you, Yanka. The Divine Office is liturgy. Which means, from the moment you begin, O Lord, open my lips, and I will praise your name, or O God, come to our aid. It is Christ's work. Okay? So, that's because it's liturgy. The rosary is not liturgy. The divine mercy is not liturgy. Okay, There is a distinguishing factor that we have to get, which we have to be careful in respect of our personal sensibilities because we can elevate the rosary to a, a height that it is not supposed to be elevated to. The mass is liturgy. Um, baptismal rite, liturgy. Um, confirmation liturgy, um, funeral liturgy. So there's certain things which are liturgy. I can't remember exactly all of them because I didn't want to go into it too much because I wanted to flow into the Eucharist and what the Eucharist is to us. Okay, so if we can grasp the fact that God's power is made present in liturgy and in liturgical settings, and that that liturgical setting is often very repetitive. Okay, you need to understand the importance of repetition for the growth in the divine life. For, um, I mean, you know, half an hour ago I was watching England play football for my penance. Boy, have I got a few days of purgatory. Um, <laughs> and... Um, I watched them playing and it's not much different to France playing Poland or to Spain playing whoever Spain played and the Netherlands playing the US of A. It's men kicking a bag of wind around on a football pitch. Okay, Repetition, repetition, repetition. It's a fact of life. For some reason, people have a problem with repetition in their interior life. But with every other aspect of life, it's just fine and dandy. We get up at six or seven o'clock in the morning, clean our teeth, have a wash, get dressed, have our breakfast and head off in our cars or whatever we're going to do. Repetition, repetition, repetition in every area of our life. But when it comes to repetition in our interior life, suddenly there's something that seems out of whack. Why? That, well, there's something you need to think about because I actually really like repetition in my interior life because I have an athletic background. And as an athletic background, you learn that repeating the exercise is absolutely vital. Yeah. So liturgy is the same. Repetition. People might come to mass sometimes and say, oh, it's the same as yesterday's. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Different readings, but similar actions. Now, the Eucharist only comes to us through the liturgy, through the Mass, okay? And it comes through the ordained minister. So here's a few things about the liturgy that I want to share with you from the Catechism. This is Article 1068. 
It is the mystery of Christ that the church proclaims and celebrates in her liturgy. The mystery of Christ is proclaimed. So some people would say, I don't quite understand the Mass, or I don't quite understand the readings, or I don't... You're hearing mystery, folks. You're hearing mystery. Something to be explored. It is not going to be fed to you on a spoon, all right? It's something you need to actually dig for. You have to investigate. You have to ponder it. You have to draw close to God so he can unveil the riches to you. It's not meant to come easy. It's meant to require work. Okay, so if people say to you, oh, we never understand the Mass, because you go from one extreme to the other, you get this idea of, oh, I don't understand the Mass, and therefore it's, it's a turn off, as it were, or I'll never understand the Mass. So it's one extreme to the other. Take the middle road. You know, I don't fully understand what's going on here, but I'm going to keep going to plumb the mystery that is set before me. Okay? It is in the liturgy, especially in the divine sacrifice of the Eucharist, that the work of our redemption is accomplished. It is through the liturgy, especially, that the faithful are enabled to express in their lives and to manifest to others the mystery of Christ and the real nature of the true church. That last line, the real nature of the true church. Um, in his book on the, the theology of the church, Cardinal Journey presents the church to us in three I think it's three different ways and it's basically the different ways in which the in which Christ was seen by the people of his time so one of the ways that Christ was seen was as a nuisance by the Pharisees in fact a demon possessed man okay at one point he is demon possessed. That's what they were saying about him. This is a viewpoint people hold of the church. They do not see it as an institution for good but for evil. Especially atheists. And consequently they want to see it destroyed. Just like the Pharisees and so on who wanted Jesus dead and wanted to plot his death um, the second one is those who see the institution uh, see the church as a human institution just as they saw Christ as just another prophet and we have this with Islam which doesn't recognize the divinity of Christ um, and which tries to convince us of his being a prophet rather than actually the son of God which we need to be firm in professing 